Hello, I'm Stefan DW. Welcome to another Turnstile Tours virtual program. Uh, Turnstile Tours is a tour company that normally takes people out around New York City to see how the city operates and uh, to meet the people who make it happen. But of course, for the last year, we've been doing that virtually, and that's allowed us to take people to some really exciting places that are normally difficult for us to get to. We're doing that today by visiting one of the most heavily traveled corridors in the country uh, and a place that is a vital part of New York City's infrastructure, uh, the uh, Delaware and Raritan Canal and the railroad associated with that. So in a few moments, we'll bring in a couple of our friends from the Canal Society of New Jersey to tell us all about that organization, the great work they do, and to introduce us to that waterway, which still has water in it today. But before we do that, just a few notes about how this is going to operate. Uh, for those of you who prefer to read what's being said, there's a closed captioning button down there at the bottom where it says live transcript and click on that and you will get an approximation of what is being said today. And uh, we really encourage interaction. We want to bring communities together. And the way to do that virtually is through the chat box. So open up that chat box and you'll see my colleagues, Cindy and Amanda are back there and they will uh, make sure that I see your questions and pass them on to our guests today. Uh, Got to go back to that screen we were looking at in just a moment ago uh, to talk about a couple of items we have coming up. Uh, we're going to keep things water uh, and waterfront oriented uh, by celebrating St. Patrick's Day a week from now with ship shanties and the shamrock uh, looking at Brooklyn and 19th century Irish waterfront. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I suspect the italics on shamrock suggest this is talking about uh, Mr. Lipton's uh, yacht. Uh, there's definitely a, a lot of yachting that happened in New York in days gone by and even today. Uh, here it is, March 19, coming up to uh, the big anniversary and our 200th episode as uh, we, we mark a year in, of uh, this extraordinary time that we've been experiencing. Uh, March 20, not a waterfront program, but one I'm really excited about. One of my colleagues, Brian Hoffman, uh, has during this pandemic, he and his son have been producing programs about uh, food and experiencing uh, new food. His son is quite young and uh, he has some strong opinions about some of the food that they mix together and eat together. Uh, it's an absolute hoot and a delight. And uh, especially if you've got young people in your life, it's a great way to, to sort of give you ideas about how to introduce them to some foods that might be a little challenging for them. So again, that's March 20th, Around the World in One Kitchen. We're coming back to the waterfront on the 22nd of March. Really important story about New York and its waterfront. Uh, where is Pete Panto? Uh, Pete Panto was an activist uh, working against corruption on the docks. Uh, it's, story was a sad one and we'll get into it uh, with a couple of people who've put a lot of research into that and of course going back home to where our office is based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and we'll explore that uh, more on March 24th and we are doing live in-person tours just like before times uh, only with masks and social distance uh, so Sundays at 10 30 you can join us in Prospect Park it's March 7th and 21st we have a couple of Prospect Park walking tours coming up uh, so uh, very excited about that, especially with the snow melting and the uh, uh, flowers blooming. I'd say it's coming. I understand things are a little snowier in New Jersey than they are here in New York City, here in Flushing. Uh, but uh, let's uh, go get a report on that. We're, uh, uh, we'd love to bring into the program now uh, Tim Roth uh, from the Canal Society of New Jersey to tell us a little bit more about what the Canal Society is and does. Uh, and welcome back, welcome back, Tim. You were here not that long ago uh, talking about uh, the Morris Canal, the other big canal in New Jersey. It's great to have you back here. How are you? That, oh, very good, Stefan. Thank you. And thank you for having the Canal Society of New Jersey back. As you mentioned, um, I did a program in December on the Morris Canal. For those who don't know, there are two towpath canals in New Jersey, the Morris Canal and the Delaware and Raritan Canal. And this is what the Canal Society of New Jersey does, preservation, history, education of the two um, canals. Um, if you missed my program in December, it's on YouTube. Just target Turnstile Troy's Morris Canal and you can find it. Today, Joe's going to do a presentation on the other canal, the Delaware and Raritan. Um, before we start that, let me just tell you a few things. If you're interested in finding more information about the canals and about what we do, our website is canalsocietynj.org. 
www.ghanaspeaks.org. There we have information about the two canals. We have, we've just added a gallery of historic photos of both. Uh, we have newsletters that we put out three times a year, have all kinds of great articles and stories. Um, and we recently added a bunch of walking brochures for the Morris Canal Greenway, which uh, is constantly evolving. So if you wanna take a trip out to New Jersey now that the weather's getting warm, there's a lot of great hikes out there. Um, we also have events. They're kind of up in the air right now because of COVID. We don't know what we'll be able to do this year or not, but if you follow our website, we will keep you updated. Also, if you do Facebook, we have a Canal Society of New Jersey Facebook page. Follow us there and we'll keep you informed on everything that's going on. And uh, so really go I, I would love to oh, I would love to say some nice things about Joe before we come in we bring him in here because I uh, uh, before I met either you or Joe uh, virtually I uh, spent a lot of time on your website and I understand Joe was instrumental in making that website happen and I just have to uh, say how much I, I admire that website it's really uh, I mean among canal societies and, in, and websites in general it's it's really beautifully done I think uh, you and the society have done a great job uh, with the, the website Websites and with the signage you have in your parks uh, and making this accessible to the public in an appealing way. Uh, I really can't uh, applaud you enough for what you've done. Uh, well, thank you very much. We, we appreciate it, Stefan. And it's continuously changing, con continuously evolving, which That's is good. great. Well, with, with that, uh, let's let's bring the man on himself. Uh, in no small part responsible for that website. Uh, and uh, Joe, uh, please join the conversation here. I know we've got people joining us from all over, uh, as far away as Stockholm, New Jersey, and uh, Manhattan and Pennsylvania, and uh, lots of people from, from all over New Jersey and Brooklyn, even as far as Kensington, Brooklyn. We'll have Joe here in just a moment as we uh, get his, uh, his video started. And uh, again, that Morris Canal program, you can find that on the website, uh, on uh, YouTube and through our website, uh, it was another great program we did here, and uh, it even involved a little bit of music, as we'll talk about the uh, canalers working on the, uh, the Morris and the Delaware and Raritan canals. They uh, uh, would signal to the locks using a conch shell horn, and uh, we, uh, we did a little uh, contest blowing our horns. We may have to uh, do that again here in just a moment. So, Joe, we'd love to see your video. We just need you to start that to get you on here. We've had a great look. Oh, there's your sound. That's a good start. Okay. Oh, there you are. Excellent. Welcome back, Joe. Well, thank well, you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's going to be a pleasure to give this presentation. Uh, when I decided to do this presentation uh, quite a while ago, I didn't realize that I was only really, uh, I only really had half the story. So I soon discovered that this story was complicated, obscure, and much better than I thought. Um, I was not going to be able to uh, just pull a book down off the shelf and get everything I needed. So um, it became a, a, a labor of love to, to bring together all the information I'm going to be able to hopefully share with you um, uh, this afternoon. The, the whole idea of a canal company and a railroad joined uh, on, as a single entity fascinated me. Um, did I say this is going to be complicated? Well, yeah, 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 you did. Uh, so wait, uh, to hold on for just a second. So, yeah, uh, so say more about that. I know we're, that's going to be a lot of what we're talking about. But so we're talking about the Delaware Canal, and uh, but you're you're saying that it was joined with a railroad. Well, you're going to learn very quickly as I as I click through my my, my presentation here how, how two two organizations uh, uh, competed for a charter to uh, uh, improve transportation across the, the route between uh, New York and Pennsylvania. And then uh, as, uh, as, as the story progresses, they decided instead of to competing, they decided to join forces. That's extraordinarily rare. And uh, uh, I'm, yeah, I can't wait to hear more. And so uh, it's not just a canal story, it's a Canal story. It's a uh, uh, it's a railroad story. It's a story about politics and sometimes dirty politics. <laughs> uh, 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 and, and, a, and a monopoly that lasted for forty years uh, and ended in in, in modern railroading uh, being what many of us remember today. Right. And when people talk, and certainly when I was in school and learned about the canals, the story I got was that we built the Erie Canal and then everybody got excited and built a bunch of canals. 
And then basically the next day we had railroads, which I've learned is not the case, but, but this is a really interesting story in that we have this relationship between the canal and the railroad. Uh, you know, my understanding is that uh, although this route, and clearly as I mentioned in the top of the show, this route is very heavily traveled even today. And looking at this map you have in front of us, we can see part of the reason why this is the shortest distance between Philadelphia and New York. It's a narrow, uh, the narrowest point of New Jersey by the looks of things. And there's a lot of reasons to travel across it. Uh, and as I recall, and, and you probably can say better than I can, uh, this was one of the early train routes as well as an early canal route. Is that correct? Absolutely. You can see from the slide that you've got a water transportation um, option going from New York to New Brunswick uh, with roads being primitive roads being a, a, a problem. Uh, uh, people traveled by water to New Brunswick and then a 25 mile uh, 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 bumpy road uh, uh, across New Jersey uh, to, to Trenton and then by water down the Delaware River to Philadelphia. Uh, certainly a doable thing, but uh, complicated, inconvenient, um, and uh, very controversial. So many people had vested interests, you know, different ah. shipping companies, you know, uh, 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 steamboat lines, uh, uh, tavern owners, uh, stagecoach lines, all had their finger in businesses that made this transportation system work such as it did um, in the early 1800s. So uh, it sounds like a magnet for corruption. Absolutely. So <laughs> I'm gonna click on, and my wheel mouse is sometimes gonna jump the head. So you <laughs> All right, thanks for the warning. Delaware uh, Raritan Canal. Uh, chartered in uh, February 4th, uh, 1830, million dollars capital, uh, going to build a canal across the narrow waste of New Jersey from New Brunswick uh, to Trenton and end at Bordentown. Uh, it's going to eventually going to cost uh, $2.8 million. Big surprise. <laughs> Uh, you also had uh, another faction interested in building a railroad, Camden and Amboy Railroad, also chartered on the same day, uh, oh. 1843, million dollars, uh, and uh, it's going to be eventually extended from South Amboy to Camden. And these these two uh, uh, rivals had been at it for years, trying to uh, get a charter from the state of New Jersey and uh, put together the uh, financing. And uh, uh, on, uh, on February the 4th, the state legislature got sick and tired of them and gave them both uh, charters and said, go to it, knock yourselves out, guys. <laughs> so they did. So the, the, the players here are uh, Robert Stockton, who is canal promoter, uh, naval officer, uh, owner of, uh, of, of shipping lines that were going to use the DNR canal and, and, and help them and make that connection to both ends. Eventually, he was a state senator. Uh, not a wealthy man personally, but he had a lot of wealthy friends, but he became very wealthy as a partner in the joint companies. The Stevens family, um, Stevens Institute, uh, people yes. know of, uh, John Stevens. Yeah, we talk father. about them a lot. They were really involved with steam navigation. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're a big story all by themselves. John Stevens, yeah, there are many, many peripheral stories. This, this, this <laughs> goes off in all directions. John, the father, inventor, uh, uh, a, a, a early steamboat pioneer. Some consider him the, the father of, uh, of uh, uh, American railroading. Hmm. Uh, his, uh, his son, Robert, who is uh, known by most railroaders as uh, a great engineer and inventor. And uh, we'll get into some of the things that he, he uh, uh, contributed later. And uh, the other son, uh, the younger son, uh, Edwin, who uh, uh, is less well known, but he was the he was the business manager, and he was the the brains behind the company. Some might have called him ruthless. I don't know people might have called him just a, a, a pragmatic businessman, but um, he is a, a an un a little known uh, hero of this story. He he put together this this uh, uh, this mix. So uh, financing the companies. Uh, the stock for the railroad went, uh, the, the books were opened and the railroad stock disappeared in 10 minutes. Everybody loved the idea of the railroad. You would have thought that the canal was going to be a sure thing, but uh, its sales lagged and it took uh, Stockton's uh, father-in-law uh, to, to purchase uh, the last uh, uh, 4,000 shares of stock to make it possible for them to fulfill their charter and to start uh, 
uh, uh, building the canal. So this was a rather unfortunate beginning. Uh, but the canal company uh, to kind of even the score uh, got added to their charter that they had the right of way to build railroad along the route, uh, uh, the, their, their chartered route. This put them in direct competition with the Camden and Amboy Railroad. So this was going to get ugly. Uh, fortunately, the, the, the uh, cooler heads prevailed and they decided to join together and form the joint companies. Uh, they would uh, share their monopoly privileges. One of the, I didn't mention before, both of these companies uh, as part of their charters was granted monopoly on the route across, a uh, monopoly for a railroad, a monopoly for a canal across the way to New Jersey. Um, no one else could compete with them. Uh, um, in these early days of material improvements, uh, it was very controversial, well, who was gonna pay for what? And so since the state of New Jersey was not going to give them money uh, and uh, these companies were gonna take all the risk, uh, they gave them privileges that would help, uh, help to, uh, make it possible for them to, 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 to accomplish these, public, these great public works. So uh, they had a monopoly uh, on, on the route across New Jersey. And uh, they also had to, they cut the state in by uh, the state was going to get a thousand shares of stock in the railroad and twenty five hundred shares of stock um, in in the canal, and so that sort of makes the state a partner in crime here. Whatever these guys are going to do, this, if the uh, the state right. is gonna profit. So, so, what was the incentive for the railroad to join with the canal? They. Um, the canal, uh, don't forget, had that had that that clause in in, in their charter that allowed them to also uh, put track along the route of their canal and directly compete with the Camden and Amboy along the same route. And so this was not going to be good for either either uh, parties. Ah, okay, got it, got it. So, and also this the the the, uh, the, uh, the granting of the joint companies also required that the canal be made bigger than planned. It was going to be seventy five feet wide and seven feet deep. So, uh, monopoly was something you know that that uh, again was was granted to try to grease the wheels uh, in the early days of, of high finance. These you these these were huge projects, millions and millions of dollars, unthinkable amounts of money in those days, and so. In order to uh, facilitate that, uh, companies were sometimes granted um, uh, a monopoly. In 1845, the privileges were extended, and so the monopoly was going to last until 1869. Whoops, there we go. Mm, there we go. Yeah, we see this with the navigation on the Hudson, too. You know, Fulton famously had a monopoly yes. there, which you know, Stevens ran up against. Uh, so these, these stories are all running into each other, sort of unsurprisingly. Again, the, the stories go off in all directions. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Delaware River and Canal, um, 43 miles from New Brunswick uh, to, to Trenton. Uh, it's going to, uh, at, at, at Trenton, which is the summit level, it's going to be joined by a feeder that's gonna bring enough water to fill the canal. Uh, from the upper Delaware, from Bulls Island, water is going to be brought down a 22 mile long feeder uh, and then fill the canal both going uh, east to New Brunswick and south to Bordentown. Bo from, um, uh, on, the, on, on the right hand side, you can see there's a cross section of the, of the DNR canal, 75 feet wide, seven feet deep. In the lower corner, there's the Morris Canal, the original Morris Canal, little baby Morris Canal. 32 feet wide, four feet deep. Uh, the Morris Canal was a, a country road and the DNR Canal was a was a uh, 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 inter interstate highway. But as we discussed in our Morris Canal program, it was a very technologically advanced country road. Absolutely, the, the, and, and those two canals vied for, for financing from the same pools of money. But uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, 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 the uh, Morris Canal uh, founder, Mr. McCullough, was interested in reviving the iron industry in Morris County, New Jersey. He was a Morris County guy and he wanted to build this canal and he realized also the coal trade was gonna be a great advantage to him. But building that canal up and over the highlands, you know, what was he thinking? <laughs> uh, 
his his story was a bit was a bit different, a bit a little bit introverted. The builders of um, um, the, the the people involved with the uh, the joint company they were transportation guys. Uh. They weren't even necessarily railroad or canal guys. They were in the transportation business. They had wide reaching financial networks, <clears throat> and they were going to use their railroad and their canal to further their 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 financial uh, business um, interests. Um, the, the, it wasn't just the coal trade, it was going to be the coastal trade that was going to make the, uh, the uh, DNR canal. There were, there were boats going to be going up all up and down the East Coast that were going to use the DNR canal to form part of the intercoastal uh, waterway that was going to greatly boom commerce um, along the East Coast of New Jersey. So uh -huh. Delaware Raritan Canal, again, uh, it's only uh, going to have to accomplish 57 feet of, uh, of elevation change. It's going to climb up from New Brunswick with uh, uh, several locks. The uh, level at, uh, at, at Trenton, it reaches the same level as the feeder. There's the feeder tapping off to the left, bringing water down from, uh, uh, from the Delaware and keeping the, uh, the canal filled. So not a great technological accomplishment. This, this, this was an easy canal. You know, no brainer. They should have done that long before, and everybody was fighting over it. And they, this was this was the solution that happened. But Just still, fourteen it. locks in twenty-two miles. That's a fair number of let's a fair number of locks to go through for the length of the canal. Yes, nothing like the Morris Canal. <laughs> no, there is nothing like the Morris Canal. I got a question from uh, my old pal Lewis. I suspect uh, where did the water come from for the canals from both ends? So this is what we're just talking about here, uh, where uh, you know, and he wants to know about how currents were handled. So, if am I correct in understanding New Brunswick? That's tidal. Is that correct? That's correct. And same with Trenton, right? Trenton, Trenton is up on a hill. Yes. It, it, is, uh, it, it is the summit level of the canal. It is 57 feet above tide. Okay, so, so, so at Trenton, I guess this may be our next slide, where, we, where they go from Trenton, are they entering the Delaware Canal? Well, the Delaware Canal ends at Bristol. So yeah, yeah. explain okay. all of that. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're gonna try to explain it as we go along. I <laughs> all right. I told you this was complicated. It is very complicated, yes. but so is okay. our geography. Uh, the, the, uh, from Trenton, the canal goes downhill to Bordentown, and at that point, it is on the level of the Delaware River uh, at at the fall line. So, uh, ocean-going vessels can 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 uh, access the canal's uh, exit point at Bordentown. So. Uh, all right, the coal trade. One of the things that's already going on is that millions of tons of anthracite coal up in, in, in uh, uh, the, the thorny hills of Pennsylvania um, is basically inaccessible, you know, un un unusable unless you can go and get it. And so people have been building canals uh, to, to, to get at that anthracite coal. Uh, uh, two of the best ones, the Lehigh Canal and the Schoolkill Canal, are accessing those, uh, those, those coal fields and bringing the coal down to the Philadelphia market. Uh, the DNH Canal is by a precarious route uh, accessing the northern coal fields and bringing coal to the Hudson and then down to the New York market. Oh, great canal, but could you do better? Well, the Morris Canal is in there. That's good, but we've already just discovered that the canal, that Morris Canal is smaller. It's got those inclined planes. Those are great, but <coughs> problematic in, in, in really building really big boats that can deliver a lot of coal. You know, enter the, the DNR uh, canal, uh, this super highway that's going to connect with that canal system and provide uh, uh, a super highway connection across New Jersey to the New York market. So, so it sounds like with the, the Morris and the DNH, you're getting higher up into the Appalachian Mountains mm -hmm. and it, conditions for canal building are becoming more difficult. Although, as I recall, DNH, you can see that long straight line of it. Uh, but much of it follows a valley, but uh, uh, this the DNR, uh, as you said, was a fairly easy build. Yes. Uh, makes a real difference. I, I love skookers. I, I was familiar with the term chunkers for people going to Mont Chunk. Uh, I actually have uh, some skookers in my, my family. We've got ancestors who were canalers on the Schuylkill Canal. Those were terms that were, they were loosely assigned to the boats that came down the Lehigh uh, system. Uh, the Lehigh navigation and other boats that came down the the the, uh, the Schoolkill navigation, both uh, were uh, canalized rivers, very complicated and 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 uh, 
very difficult, much more difficult to build than the DNR. So we've got the DNR uh, starting uh, at uh, 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 Harbor and, and, and Lock on the Delaware River at, uh, at uh, Bordentown, uh, where uh, tows of canal boats would be towed upriver from the, uh, uh, um, the exit for the, the Schoolkill Canal. Uh, and then be able to enter the DNR canal and make the crossing over to uh, uh, the New York market. So uh, are these canal boats, uh, I know the Morris Canal, we talked about how special the design was to get over those inclined planes. Uh, is the Delaware and Raritan Canal, is it taking just the, is it taking boats from the Delaware Canal and from the Schuylkill Canal? And so they're whatever those designs are or were there special boats for the Delaware and Raritan? No, there were really, there were all kinds of boats on the Delaware to Rare Canal. I'm just gonna be talking about uh, canal boats here. Uh, the, those, those much larger school kill, bo uh, school kill boats and, 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 and uh, uh, Lehigh boats, much bigger than the uh, Morris Canal boats and they didn't have to be articulated. Uh, but also by the 1840s, Mr. Stockton is uh, having uh, iron hull propeller driven uh, boats uh, built for him uh, that are going to be involved in the coastal trade and are going to use the DNR canal. So I'm sorry, can you repeat that year again? What year was that? Eight, by the 1840s. Wow, that's super early. How we want to clarification. This is, is this the canal that uh, and towpath that runs through Franklin Township by Interstate 287? Are we? Um, we're, the, uh, the DNR, is the yeah. DNR on 287? That's correct. It crosses uh, um, 287 down there. Yes, I had to refocus a second here. So anyway, yeah. this is the, this is a little known fact. This is if you look at our our, our, our uh, one of our more recent newsletters, we've had a a, a, a huge uh, uh, cache of uh, uh, material donated by one of our longtime members uh, with you know, way bills uh, for, for from from. Uh, uh, Shipping lines that that, that were uh, uh, buying, you know, uh, 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 using the canal again, iron hulled vessels, you know, uh, propeller driven, uh, uh, state of the art stuff uh, built, you know, because now they had this great uh, uh, inland waterway uh, that, that that took them, you know, uh, uh, from from. Um, from the Long Island Sound through New York Harbor, you know, a safe route across New Jersey into the Delaware Bay, through the uh, the canal down into the uh, um, the Chesapeake, and so this this was this was a great economic you know um, uh, engine. This is incredible. Yeah. So there's yeah. all kinds of vessels using the DNR canal. Wow. So okay, here's the drawings showing the uh, uh, Bordentown, uh, and then the canal reaching up. Uh, with uh, seven locks going uphill, only six miles, but uh, it's, it's going to take a long time to walk all the way up to the summit level uh, in Trenton. And so um, a typical canal boat scenario might be there would be a captain and a, a, at least a, a, a bowsman to handle the lines. And so uh, boats would arrive in a tow and then uh, be assigned, uh, the harbor master would, would assign them to a, a mule team uh, that would be supplied by uh, uh, contract stables that, uh, owned by the company. Mule drivers, you have $45 a month, good money in those days. And then you would be scheduled for departure on um, your trip across the, uh, uh, across the state. Typical canal boat, they might, you might be scheduled to leave at six in the morning and then you'd spend most all of the morning climbing up through all those locks up to uh, the Trenton level. Lewis has a question about the locks. Uh, how many uh, people does it take to operate a lock? Uh, and what were their work? Did they have days off? Were there working hours? Uh, was it only men operating locks? Could children or, or women do it? Oh dear. Uh, the DNR canal was truly a super highway. And it, uh, uh, as you'll see, as we go along, uh, great pains were made and a lot of money was spent, uh, was spent to make this canal as efficient and as fast as it could be. And so, uh, yes, there were lock tenders. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if it took one or two people to, to run one of these locks because they as you're gonna see that they were actually mechanized at some point. But, not uh, so I, I don't have a clear answer, you know, but there is no clear answer to that. All right. 
Well, more research opportunities. I love it. There we go. Yeah, um, the, the, I don't pretend that I'm, I'm t telling you everything. No way. Here's a nice map that shows the DNR canal going straight through the heart of industrial Trenton, going to the intersection of the canal, mainline canal and the feeder. And then the photograph in the upper corner shows that junction where the uh, main line of the canal is making a sharp right and heading off uh, <laughs> toward, toward New Brunswick. And that feeder canal, was that just for water? Did boats travel on that feeder canal? That was uh, a smaller, slightly smaller dimension, but it was built to be, uh, uh, so the canal boats could, could lock over from, from Pennsylvania to Lambertville and go down the feeder. Got it. So here's, here's a drawing of that. We got a 22, 22 mile long feeder from Bulls Island down past Lambertville, uh, down to the junction at Trenton. And uh, we can see some canal boats in that feeder. There's a picture on the upper right. There's the uh, canal boat being loaded at a paper mill at Lambertville. And so uh, this was both a feeder and a transportation uh, route. So here's a picture of that, that uh, outlet lock. Um, Boats would be coming down from the Lehigh Canal to Easton and then uh, traveling via the Delaware uh, Division Canal down along the paralleling the Delaware River. And uh, just below uh, uh, New Hope, that they could exit the Delaware Division Canal, cross the river by a cable ferry, enter the DNR Canal, and uh, take the option of reaching the New York market rather than continuing down. The, uh, the Delaware Division Canal to the, the Pennsylvania market. Wait, well, we have a couple of questions I want to bring in here. One, I think it's particularly pertinent to what we're looking at here. Uh, and Judy wants to know, uh, do you know uh, approximately the dates for some of the photos that we're looking at? Uh, the upper, uh, that's a postcard picture in the upper right. So that puts it, they put it in the 19 teens. But most of the canal pictures that we have are from the very late 1900s or early uh, very late 1800s, very early 1900s. People just didn't take pictures of dirty old canals. You know? <laughs> People just didn't have, you know, cameras. And you didn't yeah. take pictures of, you know, dirty old canal boats. So we're very fortunate to have the pictures that we have. It's... Um, and and but, Dave and Elaine comment, uh, it, it looks like, uh, as they understand what you're saying, just correct us if they're wrong uh, here. Uh, it, so we're talking mostly about bulk transportation. So unlike the Erie Canal, where there was passenger travel initially, uh, because the railroad and the canal came up together, and I expect we'll get back to the railroad in a moment, the canal, uh, the DNR really was just a bulk uh, goods uh, a route. Is, is that correct? Or, or were there people uh, as passengers? Most all of the canals in the uh, anthracite coal area were, were bulk cargo canals. They really, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the canal boats, you know, it's three miles an hour, you know, come on, you can walk, you know, that fast. And so um, um, it, it was a very, you know, slow transportation option. And so, and, and then there were lots of towns along the way. There were, there were, there were other transportation options for passengers that were better. And across and the, the route of the DNR, as you will see shortly, the Camden and Amboy Railroad was gonna totally, you know, steal the passenger market. That's what they were good at. It took them a long time to get to be able to handle the bulk cargoes that the canal could handle. But right away, they, they stole the passenger market. Yep, makes perfect sense. Okay, so uh, back to the main canal. Uh, canal is going to went its way uh, pretty much along the the, uh, the route of the Millstone and then the Nerares and rivers uh, across New Jersey, several locks through uh, uh, Rocky Hill and Griggstown, uh, Millstone, and eventually reach the outlet locks in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, a little canal engineering. Uh, Following the route of those rivers uh, was basically in, in, in floodplain for most of the way. So you've got the river on the left uh, and then the canal built up against the higher edges of the valley uh, uh, to the right. And so uh, you, you, can, you can drive along this route today and, and, and find the canal you know, just a little bit higher, but built just enough above the, uh, 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 the, level of, uh, uh, the level of the flow of the river to keep it out of trouble. And they did a good enough job. The canal is still there. In the, yep. in, in the photo, uh, you can see the, the canal 
both of those photos, the canal on the, on the right and the river on the left. And so the canal, uh, the river is meandering its way across the uh, uh, fairly flat farmland and the canal is following that same route, just staying above the, the floodwaters and, and safely out of the way, but uh, not a very difficult canal to build. And when you say the canal is still there, what do you mean? Well, the Delaware Merritt Canal was uh, abandoned in 1933, and uh, the state took it over in 37, I believe. And uh, um, it is owned by the state of New Jersey and operated by a, a water company uh, that uses the water that uh, the canal transports from the Delaware uh, to communities across the center of the state. So it's still in use as a water transportation system, not for not um, not for commerce but for for drinking water oh what for drinking water no less yep it's 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 still all there and do they allow people to uh to use it for for recreation as well yes they do that's great uh dave wants to know why canals were built parallel to rivers were the rivers not navigable uh no uh the uh um, rivers are, are are not dependable uh, mother nature is unfair uh Mother often uh, provides too much water or too little water. And so in order, a canal needs to be a dependable uh, man-made transportation system that <coughs> will be uh, available for boats of a standard design to, to transport uh, you know, uh, at will. And so uh, the Millstone River is a fine river, but it's not deep enough for, for boats and really too difficult to canalize. And so, uh, building uh, and engineering an artificial uh, waterway was required. And, and Ken wants to follow up on the question about navigation on the DNR today. Is it uh, still complete through Trenton? No. Uh, the uh, canal disappears into a pipe on the uh, outskirts of, eastern outskirts of Trenton and uh, emerges in the northern part of Trenton and the, the feeder is then open water all the way up to uh, Bulls Island. That's still pretty uh, remarkable. Yeah. The locks are not operational. They are, they, they are you know, spillways now. So um, um, it is not possible for it to be a transportation system now. It's purely for, 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 for uh, conducting water. It, they, they actually keep it dredged out to make sure that the canal can deliver the water that, that they, they expect. It has to be, you know, a certain dimension and a certain, you know, a million tons of water needs to be delivered and they keep it dredged out to make sure that that water will, will actually flow across the state. Oh, it's a great resource. Sounds like we've got people <laughs> watching who, uh, who use it for recreation in a variety of ways. So but, uh, let's look at these outlet, outlet locks that you've got pictured here. Uh, at New Brunswick, uh, it was uh, definitely a port on the, on the, uh, the uh, um, Raritan River. Uh, there was a large harbor uh, constructed and two outlet locks. Uh, you've, you've got uh, canal boats and, and coastal trading vessels uh, all coming and going uh, and a very, very busy place. Um, keeping up with demand. So uh, the, the, the canal uh, was successful and uh, business what was good and they needed to keep up with the coal trade and so um, over the years lots of improvements were made to make the canal uh, more efficient. Um, some of those improvements were uh, um, the canal was made eight feet deep. The, this, the, the banks of the canal were, were stone lined, were riprap lined. Uh, if you go much faster than three miles an hour the the wake of uh, 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 well, it's very damaging, isn't it? It uh, that can do terrible damage to a clay-lined canal. I understand the yeah, Delaware exactly. had huge problems. So you've got you've got to stone line your canal banks in order to 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 keep them from eroding. And so uh, the locks were enlarged and uh, drop gates were added, <clears throat> which simplified the uh, the operation. About how many people it takes to to to, to uh, run a lock uh, with drop gates, uh, you basically can do it with one one person. Huh. Other complications and, and steam power was added, and I'll show you how that worked. Also, also the telegraph had been invented, and there's a, there was a, a telegraph line all along the canal that was used to regulate traffic, control the water level, 
um, it was able to they, they were able to maintain an even faster you know 4.5 miles an hour they were really ripping along but uh, so was the telegraph used as like to check speed? Was that like a, a speed trap kind of a situation? What was going on there? Well, they, they were very concerned that traffic be always moving as fast as it could be moving. There, there should be no bottlenecks. There should be no fooling around. Uh, and to make sure everything was work, working smoothly, you've got a, tw you know, you have a 40, 44 mile long <coughs> um, operation here. And so communication via telegraph allowed uh, people to work out problems. Something, ah. something wasn't working right, boom, get on the telegraph and you know, go down the canal and do what's up and make sure that the water level is right, making sure the bridges are opening and closing right. Uh, it could all could be, you know, uh, you know, no Pony Express. You get right on the <laughs> telegraph and keep everything working. The That's picture remarkable. on the right is one of the telegraph stations still, still extant. Mm. Mm. Oh, having a little there bit of, go. there we go. Um, again, the wheel mouse is not cooperating. <laughs> Those, the canal locks were doubled in size. The original locks, uh, 110 feet long. Now they were lengthened to uh, 220 feet. And so <coughs> they could uh, 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 accommodate multiple canal boats at the same time or much larger intercoastal, you know, the, 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 those iron hole propeller driven boats, they could fit through the canal and uh, uh, greatly increase uh, commerce. And Arthur wants to know how much of the stone lining remains on the canal? Um, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to visualize some of my walks along the canal. A <laughs> whole lot of it is there, but you know, the, the, st the stone lining isn't, isn't important in today's usage of the canal. And sure. so it is not maintained. You're, you're gonna find plenty of lining and uh, uh, rip wrapping, but it's, it's not consistent. I got it, got it. I think that's a satisfactory answer. But yeah, I'm fascinated by the use of steam power, both with the locks and the boats. Uh, what, what's, yes. what was happening there? Um, again, steam power was, uh, was available. The, the Stevens uh, uh, partners here were experts in steam power. And they had already you know, uh, applied steam power to uh, uh, New York Harbor. Um, and uh, they were interested in now applying it to the intercoastal trade. And so uh, it was a, a great step forward. And be, you know, uh, people were not, you know, people, as, the same as today. Nobody wants to wait around for somebody else to make money on an idea. Um, everybody wants to step up to the bat. And uh, to, to keep things moving, once again, this was, you know, Things had to keep moving and keep efficient. They needed to. I mean, they were be, they were making their money on the tons of, uh, of of goods being transported on the waterway, not on boats sitting waiting. And so they actually inst installed uh, steam powered assists, cable assists to pull the boats through the lock. One of the the, the, the slowdowns was you know uh, boats slowly you know moving into a lock and then slowly moving out of a lock. So uh, they uh, installed steam powered winches that could pull with the cable, pull your boat into the lock and then let it uh, uh, rise or fall and then pull the boat out of the lock and get it moving as quickly as possible. Yeah, I thought I at the National Canal Museum in Easton, that's something you've been able to experience. Uh, sometimes you can, they do uh, lock rides and yeah, they drop the tow line before you get to the, uh, before you get to the lock and just drift in. That's a real slowdown. I hadn't thought of that. Evidence of that shows up in the picture in the upper right. There's a picture of one of the powerhouses with the uh, uh, second floor with uh, an observation window so that the operator can, can get a good idea of exactly what's going on. Huh. There are some other pictures. This, these are pictures at the uh, at um, um, New Brunswick. And again, you, you can see the, the stanchions in white there, uh, and the cable running, you know, along the lock in a powerhouse. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the, one of the pulleys that was used to uh, um, convey the cable. So uh, all to keep things uh, running as quickly as they could run. Uh, 
Here are some of the typical uh, boats that were used in the uh, intercoastal trade and, and by the, the, uh, um, the canal. You can see that they're much larger than, than, than uh, mule uh, driven canal boats, uh, steam powered. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the owners of the joint company owned many of the, steam, the, 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 the steamboat lines that operated on the canal. Actually, this was much more important than the canal itself. The canal was only the, 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 uh, uh, the pathway they were making their money shipping goods on the boats that they owned um, uh, as part of these steamboat lines. I, 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 this is way beyond our scope, but I'd love to know more about the paddle wheels versus uh, uh, propellers and what that transition was like, but we'll, we'll save that for another research project. Go to our website, folks, go to our website, find our, our newsletters and um, let's see, I think it's our last newsletter or the one just a newsletter before. Um, you'll find a great article on iron hull canal boats. Excellent, I can't wait. Some of that new stuff that, that we've, we've just uh, discovered. Bill McKelvey, one of our members, donated all kinds of wonderful things and uh, you'll find a great story there. So now, same time, Camden and Amboy Railroad is getting their stuff together. They have a rather simple initial plan they're building you know, a railroad across the state from Camden. Uh, they're up, up to South, South Amboy on the Raritan Bay. They're not attempting to, to do a difficult uh, uh, crossing of the Delaware River and dealing with the, the marsh, marshland around that, that separates the Jersey City from the rest of, uh, of New Jersey. They're just going to do a, a fairly easy route. And there's a great painting of uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, early railroad and, and, and coaches and uh, uh, boats coming in and passengers uh, loading. Uh, uh, John Stevens and his son, uh, uh, Robert, were uh, responsible for many technical uh, uh, improvements, accredited for many technical improvements. Uh, uh, Robert was sent over to, to England to uh, uh, learn what he could learn from, from uh, uh, the British who were very advanced in, in their rec, uh, railroad technology, and he's credited with uh, uh, having invented the T-rail. While, while on route, he, he carved a T-rail and because the, the, the primitive uh, strap iron rails were not really very efficient. With wooden, wooden beams with strap iron uh, provided a hardened surface to run, uh, to run an iron wheel, but were not nearly you know, uh, supportive enough for uh, uh, a heavy steam locomotive uh, machine to run on, and so he and he uh, envisioned uh, the T rail, and uh, in his travels of, uh, uh, around Britain, tried to find somebody who would make it for him, and nobody would touch it. He finally found one uh, fabricator in, in Wales that was interested in, in taking the chance, and, and figured out a way to to roll a T rail, a very complicated shape for the technology available in that time. Uh, other railroads, the railroad technology in the day was was supporting uh, their, their their rail systems on stone blocks, which um, was not a bad idea, but was very very inefficient. Stone blocks are heavy and hard to craft, and difficult to, to move and difficult to set. And uh, he uh, is also credited with inventing the uh, railroad tie system that we understand today and the hook spike. Uh, uh, railroad spikes, as you see across the bottom of the picture, they were used to fasten the rails to uh, to the cross ties. So, uh, so some some great uh, uh, railroading advances. Absolutely, those are sort of the icons of railroad. You, 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 when I, you tell me a railroad track, those are sort of the three four elements that really come to mind. That's and all from, from that trip. That's amazing. There are some extant uh, remains of. Uh, the, the, the original route of the uh, of the Camden and Amboy Railroad with the stone blocks still in place. Wow. You can go out and find that. They also uh, sent to England and uh, from one of the very earliest uh, steam locomotives, the John Bull. Uh, it was crafted in, in, in England and shipped over here in pieces. They had to hire um, Isaac Dripper to put it back together again. He didn't come with any instructions, by the way. <laughs> and, and who was Isaac? Uh, what do you know about him? 
Well, he, he, he was an engineer, such as engineers were in those days, a, a, a mechanic who uh, had some uh, uh, knowledge of, of steam powered uh, equipment and uh, figured out how, how, to, how all these p p pieces should, should be assembled. So uh, he's credited with actually having to have having uh, figured out how to successfully assemble the John Bull and make it work. This was an amazing machine. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, was their first locomotive and, and uh, successfully operated on the Camden and Amway Railroad. Um, it's still around. You can go and see it in the Smithsonian Institute. It's still there. And is, they're very proud of it. It was actually refurbished a number of years ago and they loved it so much that they took it out for a ride. So there's a picture of some of the folks from the Smithsonian on actually with the cam, with, with, with the John Bull on the rails. And I'm sure that if you go online, you can find a video of them taking the, the John Bull for a ride. Amazing machine uh, built in the 1830s and it still works. I just want to take a moment to say we've got a few people are leaving as we approach the the uh, hour mark on our program. We're going to keep going and get this in here, but uh, we uh, for those of you who do have to to leave us, uh, we will have this posted and available later as well. But we'll we'll try to to keep it moving. Okay, we're going to move along. Uh, the, the the railroad was a businessman's dream. All of a sudden, that that trip from Phil from New York to Philadelphia could be accomplished in uh, catch the five o'clock. Uh, steamer, get the 11 o'clock train, um, get to Philadelphia, and come home by 10 o'clock in the evening. This was unheard of. The Acela of its time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> finding off competition. They, the uh, 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 Camden and Envoy folks, the Stevens family, was uh, had great ambitions. Mr. Irwin was uh, an ambitious, ambitious fellow, and they um, quickly as soon as uh, they began to succeed with their Camden and Amboy Railroad, other uh, railroad companies like the uh, Philadelphia and Trenton uh, <coughs> began to uh, try to compete by building a railroad from Philadelphia up to uh, uh, across from, from, from Trenton, and they attempted to buy the uh, uh, the Turnpike Company uh, across New Jersey and uh, tried to buy the uh, the uh, Delaware and Trenton Bridge Company. And so the, the joint companies uh, immediately you know, stepped in and undermined them and, uh, and, and then stole their thunder and uh, planned their own uh, route of creating them. What they really wanted to do was an all rail route directly to New York Harbor. And so the first step was to inquire of the railroad from Pennsylvania to Trenton and then the Tren Trenton uh, Bridge. And then um, uh, they began to build a connection from, uh, from Trenton to New Brunswick. Um, another railroad company had been chartered in Northern New Jersey, you know, far enough from their, uh, their, their, their monopoly privileges. The New Jersey Railroad uh, uh, planned to build a railroad from Hoboken to New Brunswick with the uh, of uh, the hopes of being able to combine with the, uh, the Camden and Amboy and make a through route uh, all the way across the state. Um, however, the, the, the Camden and Amboy people never played fair. And so uh -huh. they, they slowly built their railroad to New Brunswick and kept just short of the, uh, of the connection long enough to completely stress out the New Jersey Railroad, let them run down their money until they were desperate and then made the connection uh, only when they got the best possible terms for uh, who was going to profit from the through traffic. These guys played rough and tumble. So uh, through route from, uh, from Trenton to, uh, to Hoboken. So they were, they were crafting a complicated route that was really going to uh, change the railroading uh, across the state of New Jersey. I'm gonna to try to move along more quickly. Uh, by the 1840s, they uh, have spent $3 million on railroad infrastructure. Uh, they had uh, 15, locom uh, 70 locomotives, lots of passenger cars. Uh, they were really doing very well. Um, however, they were a very tight just in management policy. They really didn't spend any money on safety. They didn't bother to double track their line. No, too much money. They, they had a monopoly on this route. They, they didn't have to worry about competition. Nobody else was going to get a cheaper fare 
um, on another railroad. And so they, they played that card to, uh, uh, to their, their own advantage. Um, they also uh, in, in, in involved in some, some uh, creative bookkeeping. They were obliged <laughs> to pay the state of New Jersey uh, um, a tariff on, on, on their profits. And so uh, they, uh, they adjusted the books. They were caught at a uh, twice. Once was that they managed to politically maneuver and another one they were fined. Uh, but uh, they also uh, gave uh, preferential uh, shipping rates to the uh, shipping companies that they owned and uh, uh, so that they made their profits uh, uh, on the boats, on, on, on the steamboats rather than on, on, on the canal. So that they, they were very, very, very conniving and they were very politically connected. And so Certain uh, things like uh, no franchise so valuable as the, as the joint companies was, you know, their idea of what they were doing, and uh, no company so despicable was what was often in the papers written about them. Okay, uh, by the 1860s, their <coughs> monopoly was due to expire. Uh, actually, uh, all of the uh, uh, original founders had passed away. And so uh, uh, a new, new group of management, uh, a new management group with uh, a little steadier hand uh, took over and realizing that uh, they had to change their, their, uh, their operating uh, uh, ideas uh, because their monopoly was gonna be gone. They were gonna now have to compete with um, other ventures. So they formed the United New Jersey Railroad and Canal Company. And so, and that combined all of their, their assets under one name and uh, sought to find how they could then continue in the most profitable way. And so uh, Mr. Irwin had passed away. And so uh, their monopoly is going to expire. And so uh, they are, let's just gonna go on here. They best offer, they, they were still relatively a small railroad. They're, they're, they're a, 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 a big fish in the New Jersey market, but uh, uh, and the, compared to other railroads like the Pennsylvania Railroad, a huge uh, uh, corporation with, with uh, railroad running uh, many, uh, many, 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 many miles of railroad. Uh, they were small fish. However, they controlled that access to New York Harbor and the Pennsylvania Railroad absolutely wanted that access. They had a, a railroad to Philadelphia, but New York was the, the financial capital and they had to have it. So they gave the uh, joint companies the best offer. And so they agreed to lease <coughs> the Camden and Ann Boy um, uh, Railroad and all of its assets, including the canal for 999 years uh, and they were going to, uh, they, they really, really wanted this, the, uh, this route and they were willing to pay for it. 10% dividend, uh, which came the first year they were paying the owners of the joint company $1.9 million for use of their railroad. And that's in those, that day's dollars, right? That's for in 1871 money. It took them a long time to be able to, uh, to make that, that, that financial commitment actually profit them, but they really, they absolutely they really needed that, that connection. So uh, what they got was uh, 260 miles of, of, of railroad and uh, 280, uh, uh, 128 locomotives, lots of stuff, including 77 canal boats. I'm sure they were gl glad to get those canal boats. <laughs> <laughs> they were obliged to run the canal and to run the railroad and uh, they, they got uh, uh, all this stuff. The important thing is they got access to the New York Harbor. They desperately wanted that. And so uh, the owners of the joint company profited mightily. And uh, that arrangement lasted for 99 years. Can you imagine making 10% on your, on your <laughs> uh, 401k for, for 99 years guaranteed? Wow. So, um, the arrangement was much more complicated than can be described here, but uh, by uh, 1968, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad needed to merge, or, uh, merge with the New uh, York Central, formed the Penn Central, and uh, by 69, uh, they had run up um, $83 million worth of debt, and by 1970, they were bankrupt. 
So that ended the, uh, the uh, railroading as it, as, as it was in those days. Um, now, of course, the, uh, uh, the canal, uh, railroading is completely different these days. <laughs> the canal is still there. And so uh, it was uh, ceded to the state of New Jersey in <coughs> uh, 1934 and uh, is a state park and uh, accessible to the public, uh, a great asset. Uh, you can go there and walk the towpath, bike the towpath, canoe in the, in the, uh, in the canal, uh, approximately a million people a year visit the, 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 uh, uh, the DNR Canal and uh, it's still a great uh, place to, to, uh, to see and visit. So it's still with us. That's fantastic and a great thing to do uh, in the uh, hopefully waning days of this pandemic. Get outside and enjoy some time along the, uh, the remains of the canal. That's the end of my presentation. If there are any other questions, I'd be glad to give it a try. Uh, yeah, we welcome questions. I just have to say how struck I am uh, by how much the DNR, you know, if you look at the history of canals and railroads, the DNR really uh, is emblematic of, of that history. You know, uh, we see 1871, we find more and more railroads. Uh, my understanding is that we have more and more railroads on the same gauge. So you can have uh, train cars going from one system to another. That's really where railroads come together. And that's uh, you know, the DNR is there early uh, with canals and railroads and then transitions over to the Pennsylvania right at the end there where uh, railroads really came together. Uh, we do have a couple of people commenting here in the last uh, uh, few moments. Uh, everybody basically saying they loved uh, your presentation and really uh, thought you did a great job. One, one additional factoid that I, I, I missed here was that uh, actually uh, the DNR Canal had its most profitable year in 1871, and that was the year that the joint companies was leased to the Pennsylvania Railroad. So uh, actually the, the canal was, was uh, making good money, unlike many other canals, <laughs> the most profitable year when it was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. That is absolutely remarkable. And uh, uh, we've got some people looking for details on tables of tonnage and profit by year. And folks who are gonna look up that Morris Canal program, uh, I think uh, even contact the folks at the Canal Society of New Jersey and uh, they will have lots of details. I highly recommend their website and their newsletter as well. Uh, any last uh, remarks, Joe, before we sign off and let people get on with a beautiful day outside? These are great stories. Follow them along. We're, we're doing this all the time. Uh, there's more story that there's no time to tell you now. <laughs> uh, there's uh, with, with, with uh, the amount of information that's online these days. Uh, it, uh, get out there. If this is your passion, search and learn. And uh, this is the way this story came together. Uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, and hear what you think. And uh, we'd love to share with you information that we have. Great, and I uh, look forward to your having uh, in-person events again as uh, health conditions permit, and we'll, we'll all get out to Waterloo Village and, and the DNR Canal. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll, folks, we will uh, have, be in touch with further information uh, through our website to our subscribers, and of course, uh, uh, look at the Canal Society of New Jersey webpage. And until then, stay safe and uh, enjoy your spring. Take care. Thank you, Joe. So long. Thank you.